So it gives me great honor to introduce the next speaker, and I'd like to read a bio first before I do that. And I know in my time uh, dabbling in activism with I Don't Know More, I, I, I paid close attention to what she was saying. And she was very honest and very truthful about her words. She didn't mince words. She didn't sugarcoat uh, words. And she, again, I just like to say she was done out of love. And it just reminded me so much of elders that I listened to growing up. Our next speaker is Palm Pam. Palm Pam. He's a Mi'kmaq lawyer, professor, author, and social justice activist from Eel River Bar First Nation in New Brunswick. She has four university degrees and her master's and doctorate in law from Dalhousie University specializing in, in, in Indigenous law. She currently holds the position of professor and chair in Indigenous governance at Ryer University. A practicing lawyer for 20 years, Pam has volunteered and has been volunteering and working in First Nations issues for over 25 years on a wide range of issues like socioeconomic conditions, Aboriginal and treaty rights, and legislation impacting First Nations. Pam was one of the spokespeople and public educators for the I Don't Know More movement and advocates alongside other movements focusing on social justice and human rights. Her current research focuses on police racism, abuse, and sexualized violence against Indigenous women and girls and its contribution to the crisis of murder, missing, traded, and exploited indigenous women and girls. And I've met Pam a few times in the past, and I know that she's very uh, approachable, and she's uh, such a kind-hearted woman. Please welcome Pam Paul Manor. Reconciliation, we just come so 
somewhere and learn something and that's nice information and we all go away. We have to find ways to actually put that into action and do something. And we have been. And one of the reasons why I jumped at the chance to come here when I was invited by Cora and AMC is because Manitoba has been leading the way in so many ways on this. And I also know that our ancestors are walking with us when we do this. Um, this, is a, this is a very important issue. This literally determines our future. Because the rates keep increasing, and they can only increase so much. You can only get to 100%. You can only get to 100%, and we can't wait until it's that long. So just, you know, FYI, because I am a lawyer, I have to say that whatever I'm saying here today is offered in the spirit of respect. Um, they're just mere considerations, um, and you all have your own legal counsel, and uh, I'm not trying to, to replace their uh, legal advice. And so we, we know why we're here. And, and even this um, statistic doesn't, you know, say it all. We're, it's not, we're not talking about Indigenous children in care, because when you put First Nation, Métis, and Inuit statistics together, it, it's a pan-Aboriginal approach that doesn't talk about our lived realities. And we know that when you take the other statistics out, that it's higher rates in First Nations. I mean, devastating rates. And we need to keep that focus on us and on our children. We have to talk about the seriousness of it. We know now that it's more than 50% of kids in care. And here in Manitoba, this is ground, ground zero. But it's no coincidence that Manitoba has always been the heart of the resistance. This is the place where people have been resisting. And so they clamp down harder. That's what these statistics show. We also know that every time we post a statistic on First Nation kids in care, it's already outdated. In a year, those numbers have increased. In a year, the problems have gotten worse. And this is despite whatever government has been in power. Whether it's conservative, whether it's liberal, whether it's NDP at the federal or provincial level, it doesn't matter. They're all doing the same thing. They just present it in a different package. One is angry and berating, and this is all your fault kind of package, but the rates still increase. The other package comes from a government that says, we agree with you. This is colonization. This must stop. This is a humanitarian crisis but the package is still the same. They're still doing the same things and the rates keep increasing. And we know it's not just in foster care, it's in prisons, it's in the rate of human traffickers, it's in the rate of kids that are impoverished, it's in the rate of education rates. It's not changing and we can paint reconciliation all over it. We can do selfies, we can give them blankets, we can do whatever we want to try to meet with them in a good way, but things haven't changed. And that's why I really appreciate what the Women's Council was saying, what the Elder was saying, that the power is with us. And it doesn't feel that way. And it's unfair that we have all of this challenge, the obstacle of genocide. I mean, literally, we are negotiating genocide. We are trying to find ways to navigate genocide survive and still protect our children. When they have the numbers, they have the wealth, they have everything. But what they don't have is our ways and our spirit and our connectedness and our strength and our resilience. And us as warriors, only warriors can survive a genocide that has been ongoing for 500 years. Only warriors. we have the unfair burden of being warriors because the child welfare system isn't just unfair it's not a, an issue it's not a program real lives are being lost to the child welfare system lost not just in the sense of how many days and nights you're away from your aunties or your grandies or your parents or whoever you have those familial bonds with but we know that genocide and these genocidal policies which work together create and 
complex obstacle course for our kids. That just entering into the foster care system now means you have to jump hurdles. You have to try not to be involved in uh, human trafficking. You have to try not to be homeless. You have to try not to get to prison. You have to try to defend yourself from all of these things, and we're asking our kids to do this. When they're supposed to just be growing up and learning from us, our culture and languages, they're supposed to be focused on nation building and really enjoying everything about what it means to be an indigenous person. That is not fair that these kids, through no fault of their own, know that they will have a less chance of getting a high school education and a greater chance of going to prison just because of who they are. Because Canada targets us on genocide. But because we're warriors, since contact, we have been resisting all of this. Since contact, not just our leaders, but our <coughs> grassroots people have been rising up and saying, we, are, we can't do this anymore. And yes, we're messed up. We are all colonized in this room. And that means a whole bunch of messiness. And sometimes we don't like each other, and sometimes we like to shoot each other down, and we don't agree with each other's politics. But ultimately, we have to forgive ourselves for being colonized and focus on the matter at hand. You can hate me later. You can hate your ex-boyfriend later. You can hate your cousin later. We can have all those fights later. But right now, we have tens of thousands of people who stood up during Idle No More to say, please bring our kids back home. We had the um, Justice for Our Stolen Children camp in Saskatchewan that went on for almost a whole year of people camping on the legislature saying, you've got to stop stealing our children. You have Occupy INAC. All over the country, people were occupying INAC offices because our people didn't know what else to do. Because of the high rates of suicide, a large number of them from being in care. And every time we rise up, you can be guaranteed there will be a federal and provincial government there to try to push us back. And that's what this other picture is. You had leaders in Saskatchewan trying to make sure that their kids are kept in first, at least First Nations care, and the province going after them. And you don't have it much better here. What you do have, though, is all of you. You have the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs leadership, who have for decades have been saying, even before Wawa, but also in Wawa, which was a direct resistance to the white paper and kids in care. And it was focused on sovereignty, nationhood, and jurisdiction. Everything goes wrong when we're not in control. And it doesn't matter what law or policy they pass or what funding envelope they offer. If we're not the ones in control, everything goes wrong. So of course, they've been passing resolutions for decades saying it's about our jurisdiction and asserting our jurisdiction. But not in an unreasonable way. We're also, many of us, treaty partners. So you have all these First Nation leaders and grassroots people constantly reaching out to federal and provincial governments to say, we want to work with you in a good way. And we get slapped back, and we keep extending our hand and saying, we want to work with you in a good way. So political negotiations have never been given up. It's an ongoing process, but sometimes our people don't see that. It happens behind the scenes. And look at the AMC Women's Council. They have taken this issue and run with it. Unlike others that I have seen in this country, and we heard all of the, the women who spoke this morning and Chief Meaches, who's like, we have got to just take our power back and do this. Or the, the alternative is let the federal provincial governments do it, and that guarantees the end. That guarantees the end. That guarantees 100% foster care rate. Thank goodness we have people who, despite navigating genocide, are still saying, we are not going to let you win. We are going to stand up for our kids because they can't right now. And that includes engaging with communities. That includes lobbying. That includes drafting your own laws, your own dispute resolution mechanisms. All of that, how you want it, when you want it, all of it, little parts of it, it's just doing it. Because that's the next step 
there. Sometimes we fall into this mistaken idea that if we're going to assume responsibility, we have to have all of our laws in place. We have to have all of our band membership and our election codes and our residency bylaws and our all we have to have it all done. If we wait till it's all done, it won't get done. We need to just start and make all of our mistakes because we're going to make mistakes. And some of our laws will be challenged and we'll have to amend them. Some of them will have to be repealed, and that's okay because that's sovereignty. That's nation building, that's exercising our jurisdiction and making our own mistakes. Because it certainly can't be worse than genocide. And I know because of colonization, sometimes we don't have a lot of faith in our current leaders. But remember, it doesn't matter what First Nation you come from, your First Nation is bigger than any particular chief you like or don't like. Any particular band manager you like or don't like. Any neighbor you like or don't like. Our kids depend on us to look beyond that and go ahead and be nations and exercise our sovereignty and make all these mistakes and get them out of the way. Because then it just makes us stronger. And look at what you have here. I mean, the, the First Nations Family Advocate Office. What a unique thing to have here in Manitoba. Think of all of the lives that have been impacted. Not just keeping kids out of care, but just the mothering classes, the parenting classes. That's incredible. That's sovereignty in action. Because who is going to love our kids more than we will? I guarantee you it won't be the province of Manitoba. And I guarantee you it won't be any federal bureaucrat making their six-figure salaries. And that's not to say that any of them aren't nice people as individuals, but they all work for the machine, and the machine continues to advocate our genocide in ways that they think of what's best for us. How they deter and best interest of the child usually means take you away from your parents. And that racism and bias and, and hatred has never left the system. And nothing in the legislation, in fact, does anything about that inherent racism, hatred, and bias that makes them use their discretion that way. And that's a real issue. So we have Cora Morgan and all of the people that are working with her and all of the chiefs and the women's councils and all of the grassroots people who have been feeding into this exercise of our sovereignty and saying, no, we're going to do it our way because genocide's no go for us. That's pretty amazing here in Manitoba. That's something that you can build from. And I'm sure I don't work there. I'm sure it's not perfect. I'm sure they're not doing everything. And I'm sure they don't have enough funding. And I can guarantee you, we will never have enough funding, ever. That doesn't mean we can't move forward. That doesn't mean we shouldn't move forward and do whatever we can. And they're not the only ones. Manitoba was way ahead of everybody else. So you have the, you know, the Family Advocate Office and all the chiefs and grassroots people here in Manitoba saying, hey, we're in a crisis. You also have numerous reports about all of the abuse and neglect that happens in foster care and all of the terrible things that happen to kids. And yes, there are exceptions, there are always exceptions, and there are always urgent situations. But we know statistically what we're doing to these kids. We have the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal that has found that Canada, the number one cause, the root cause of so many kids in care is Canada's purposeful and racially discriminatory underfunding for First Nation kids in care. That's pretty significant. We know the National Inquiry has linked First, First Nation kids in foster care to the pipeline to murder and missing. And we also know it's a pipeline to prison, and it's a pipeline to hopelessness, and it's a pipeline to addictions, and it's a pipeline to just ill health and loneliness and not feeling like you belong. Even Indian Affairs calls it a humanitarian crisis. Oh, that's one of my pet peeves. Every time they use one of our words, they say, this is very colonial, this is a crisis. But they're the ones that are actually doing it. And then they'll go on to say, but oh, we're making an important first step. And here's the problem. With celebrating Canada every time it says, we're doing an important first step, they've never gotten off of the first step. Everything is an important first step, and they never go beyond it. I swear if anyone in here says that to me, I'm like, I'm going to lose it. It's my pet peeve. 
But you have also, despite knowing what the root cause is, that First Nations are in control, and that Canada racially underfunds First Nation kids in care, what happened with these national Aboriginal organizations saying the solution is legislation? Why stand by the federal government and say, yes, more federal legislation that includes provincial legislation? Remember, genocide is the complex weave of all of these pieces of legislation. It's a man. Government legislation is going to be good for us. And why? Because the government said so? How is that a solution? And, and please strip away your politics, because I am not liberal, I'm not conservative, I'm not NDP, I'm not members of any of these organizations. I am speaking just factually. How is that the solution? How is a millions and millions and millions of dollars going to national Aboriginal organizations so they can hire more staff and do more research and sit at more tables doing anything for our babies on the ground? Because they're not there when those kids are taken, but chief and council are, the elders are, the mamas are, for those mamas that survive. Because we also know statistically that mamas who lose their babies are far more likely to die of heart attack and stroke and depression and suicide. What's happening here? Genocide has a very physical impact on us. And then, what gives them the right to say, this is what we think the solution is, thank you government for doing this, and forcing it on First Nations who say no? Whatever happened to free prior informed consent for First Nations? That's kind of an issue. When now, we're not just fighting federal and provincial governments, now we have to worry about national organizations and what their agenda is. The only entities with sovereignty on Turtle Island are the Anishinaabe and the Cree and the Mohawk and the Mi'kmaq. Our nations are the ones with sovereignty. Our nations are the ones with rights. Not national Aboriginal organizations. But again, we didn't just take it. We didn't just say, well, you know, it's better to just be in unity. Because it is better to be in unity. Unless, unless unity perpetuates genocide. We can unify ourselves into oblivion if that's what we want to do. Or, like the warriors here in Manitoba, they say, no, that, that's not good. That might be good for you, you go ahead and do that. But for us, that's not good. So you have the AMC chiefs, you have the women's council, you have the family advocate office, the grandmother's walk. You were loud about your resistance to C-92 and to what was happening. But you aren't the only ones. Representatives from treaties 6, 7, and 8 all over Alberta protested on their own days. Ontario, there was massive First Nation resistance, saying absolutely not. No. No means no. And yes, no means no in an Indigenous context, too. It means no in a First Nation context. But because of the support of the National Aboriginal Organizations, which made a plea to all Canadians who are actually not involved in the foster care system with our kids, pled to, that, to Canadians to write to their MPs and senators and say, please support this bill, never mind all of these First Nations in all of these provinces who don't want it. So here's all the stages. It went through all the stages for something so monumental, so impactful as the future of our kids, it went through Parliament and Senate pretty quickly. And with the worst of bitter ironies, and I swear they do it on purpose, on National Indigenous Peoples Day, that's when royal assent is given to this legislation. And last year, you know what they did on National Indigenous People say they refuse to remove gender discrimination from the Indian Act, which would exclude about 50 to 60,000 kids from being members in our communities and being protected from the foster care system. So, the federal government says, but wait, there's a lot of pros to this legislation.
but I, I put in red, there's actually potential cons as well. This is legislation to hold us accountable. We will now take action on First Nation kids in care. The preamble, the part that doesn't have any legal significance, references the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, the UN Convention on, on the Rights of the Child, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's the first time the federal government has said, yes, we will recognize you have your own jurisdiction under Section 35 to govern over kids and, and families. They made a political commitment to funding, but didn't make a Treasury Board submission for funding. But please support this legislation because you know what? We, we promise, we promise, like all of our other promises, we're going to give you money. They also made a political commitment that they were recognizing full and fulsome First Nation jurisdiction, that First Nation laws would be paramount. Who wouldn't support that kind of legislation if, in fact, that was the case? And they said the national standards in this law will supersede all provincial laws. So finally, you're going to get the provinces out of your families. And there'll be some flexibility to accommodate diverse groups. So you could engage as a First Nation, or a collective of First Nations, or a treaty area, whatever was your decision. Those were the cons. Sorry. Not a slip, kind of a slip. Those are the pros that they claimed of this legislation. But here's the cons. First of all, it's pan-Aboriginal legislation. And for anyone who maybe has not studied the law of equality under the Charter, there's this concept that when you make everyone the same, so formally equal, you ingrain discrimination and inequality. So what they've done here is put First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on all the same footing which to them they interpret as the lowest common denominator. Métis simply don't have the same rights as First Nations do. They don't have the same historical context. Um, many of them don't have the same treaties. But they put them all in one piece of legislation and all in one funding pot. So when you put all the statistics together, it makes uh, foster care not look as bad. Whereas if you were just to look at First Nations, it's in an urgent crisis and demand a differentiated kind of funding mechanism. So they've embedded in law discrimination against First Nations so that we will automatically, by the passing of this law, be treated in an unequal way. There is no independent recognition or legal status of First Nation laws. That's the biggest myth that they have perpetuated. What you get under the Act is federal law, not provincial law. Not First Nation law, it's federal law. So that's a myth. The cons that they said didn't pan out. There is no statutory guarantee of funding. We argued vehemently before Parliament and Senate, you must include a statutory guarantee that A, you're responsible to fund it on a needs and rights based way, and B, that you will fund it. And they said no. Why? Because they hadn't done a Treasury Board submission. But they wouldn't tell us that at Parliament and Senate. You know how we found out that they had no money for any of this? It's because they were cross-examined at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. That's how we know. But wow, what a sales job they did. The minister retains the powers under the Act and all of the powers for regulations. How is that First Nations law again? How is that uplifting First Nations jurisdiction? We don't even actually get a say in the drafting of those regulations. Who knows what's going to be in those regulations? And there's a whole bunch of stuff missing from it. If you are going to have legislation, and not everyone agrees that you needed legislation, maybe you could have had an agreement with appropriate funding. Maybe that would have done. But instead, you have a scenario where we don't talk about ensuring by law maximum contact with family. We don't ensure by law that it's mandatory that data be kept and that First Nations own that data. We don't have it ensured in law that they will pay through the teeth for everything they don't live up to. It's simply not in there. But it's not like First Nations and First Nation X, 
experts and community members and even some kids who had grown into foster care had come to Parliament and Senate and said, hey, here's what we're recommending. Some of us don't want your federal legislation because that's part of the genocidal machine. What we want, just funding agreements. Give us needs and rights-based funding agreements. Address all the underlying root causes and focus on prevention. And we'll take care of the rest. That's what they wanted. Others said, well, we're not cool with legislation, but if you do legislation, it has to be First Nations specific, not pan-Aboriginal. You have to get our free prior informed consent before you pass it. And some of us want opt-outs. We want to opt out of the legislation, but with funded alternatives. What good is a legislative opt-out? Okay, I'm not in legislation, but there's no alternative. And we know how they play that game. We wanted targeted statutory funding that was First Nations specific only. We wanted the inherent right to be legislated, not subservient under Section 35. And they could have done that. They could have repealed Section 88. So Section 88 in the Indian Act is what allows provincial laws to apply with regards to child welfare and a bunch of other things. And they didn't get rid of that. They didn't list the specific harms or mandate collect, uh, connections. So there have been a lot of First Nation experts that have been speaking on this, legal experts, who have been trying to get the government to just listen. Not politicians saying, here's what looks good for our organization, but experts that work with communities on the ground, that work with mamas, that work with the chiefs, that work with women's councils. And they have been saying the same thing over and over and over again. Now that the legislation is passed, the biggest concern of lawyers and even justices, because I, I work with different justices across the country, is wow, this looks like chaos in a box. Even judges have no idea how this is going to unravel. There's no regulations, there's no federal policies around how this will roll out, not just what the law says, not just the piece of paper. But here's how it gets administered. Here's who makes decisions. Here's the, you know, the pecking order. Here's the delegated authorities. None of that is done. None of it. There's no practice guidelines. And, and that's important for lawyers and judges to know, OK, well, uh, who, who has jurisdiction here? Which court do we go to? Is it federal? Is it provincial? Uh, lower courts? Well, who has jurisdiction here? And then when do you appeal? And who do you appeal to? So what they've done by including concurrent jurisdiction without setting out which rules are paramount in a very clear way, even courts don't know what's going to happen. And courts already are doing severe damage to our kids and taking our kids away. Now what's going to happen if a court's presented with chaos? In all likelihood, they're just going to revert back to doing what they already did. So chaos and uncertainty guarantees the status quo, because the status quo is comfort and certainty for all the people that are in the system. And nobody wants to make any mistakes, and nobody knows who's liable under this system. Within a year, let's just say within a year, a third of First Nations, so 200 and some First Nations all have their own laws, but they all live in the same province. So different agencies are going to have to know what those laws are, what all of those uh, legal systems are, the courts are going to have to know that, and the federal government has offered no funding, no education, no training for anybody on any of this. And we know who suffers. As adults, we'll work our way around it, but kids, they have a really hard time. So that was um, uh, Hadley. She's a, a, an Indigenous law expert. And Cindy Blackstock also said, OK, well, what about the funding? Where's the commitment to funding here? I mean, that was really the biggest myth. Canada refused to make itself responsible for First Nation funding for kids in care in the legislation. So that's a big sign. You know how Dr. Phil says when people tell you who they are, you should listen? Well, if they meant we are going to provide you funding, don't worry, then what's the harm of putting it in the legislation? Right? We're not stupid. We know exactly what they're doing. These are political games that they hope we fall for every time. They refuse to include Jordan's principal. The CFS funding so far is still only restricted to provincially mandated agencies, and Canada has been non-compliant with every single order from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, just to stop discriminating. So if you put all that evidence together, 
you don't have to be a genie to know, hmm, I'm going to predict the future and imagine what's going to happen here. They haven't lived up to any of their um, responsibilities yet. And then we have Naomi Mutala, who, with a bunch of others, Sarah Morales and others, wrote this report for the Yellowhead Institute at Ryerson that talked about, that basically gave the legislation a failing grade. Because the national standards don't include anything about provincial accountability. What if everything continues on as the same? What's our accountability mechanism for the province to get them to stop, or the federal government? There's no mechanism to deal with one of the major root causes, all the racism and bias in the justice system. And here in Manitoba, you've had an Aboriginal justice inquiry in Manitoba. That said, it's rampant, it's full. Ontario's had the same kind of justice inquiry. That said, it's full, it's full. It's infected with racism. Where, how do we address that? Where's the accountability mechanism? Where do we get to rain judges in? continue to take our kids away and not committing in this legislation for the federal government to provide any funding and says here First Nations you go off and try to negotiate an agreement with the province the very people who, who get rich off of our children and, and you're going to tell me that the, the province of Manitoba or any province is just going to say oh yeah here you can have all this money and you can do it all yourself the provinces haven't come out in support of this legislation. In fact, the provinces, there's been mumblings around having a constitutional challenge, perhaps. Maybe they don't like this. Maybe they want to retain this jurisdiction in all these systems. And then what happens with this legislation? There's no binding dispute resolution mechanism. What if, what if you create laws, they become federal laws, and the RCMP don't enforce them? or they don't allow your tribal officers to enforce them because they're only quote-unquote public safety officers and you can't do child welfare. Then what? Where are, is our rights mechanism? Where is the enforcement mechanism? So that really calls into question, does this bill do anything to ensure that First Nations get to exercise their inherent rights and sovereignty around First Nation kids and care? It's not looking that way from a legal standpoint when you read the legislation. You have to give the government the benefit of the doubt. You have to assume they're going to read in and do things that aren't in the legislation. And we should know better because where is the federal government today? They are in court trying to quash the compensation order for First Nation Kids in Care and, and stop all of it. That's where they are right now. You don't see them in the media supporting C92 and all the money that's going to come and how we're going to strengthen your systems. So we have to stop believing them. I don't know what more evidence we need. So here's a few important clarifications around C92. Because of all of this government propaganda, there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings about what's in it and what isn't in it. First of all, First Nation laws, so-called First Nation laws, come into force one year after you give notice to the province of Manitoba if you can't come to a coordination agreement or it's set out in the coordination agreement when those laws will come into effect. But the second that that one year time clock runs out or you have a coordination agreement, they're not First Nation laws anymore, they're federal laws under federal jurisdiction. And then the dispute in the act comes between federal, are these federal laws? paramount or not to the provincial laws that still continue to apply. Because these federal laws will only be considered paramount or greater than provincial laws if there is a conflict. But then a provincial court judge can say, well, we don't care about this jurisdictional dispute anyway, because we say the best use of the child is that they're not in the community. And then it doesn't matter what the federal, <laughs> provincial, or, or First Nation laws are at the end of the day, because best interest of the child as they define it trumps all that. The Charter trumps all that. The Canadian Human Rights Act trumps all of that. Various sections of the Act trump all of that. So it's a very impoverished version of First Nation laws, if indeed that's First Nation laws. And it's also subject to 35. And remember, Section 35 of the Constitution that protects Aboriginal treaty rights, even those rights aren't protected on a priority level in the Constitution. 
the Supreme Court of Canada has said, here's a whole bunch of reasons why the government is, can rightfully interfere with your rights. The settlement of foreign populations, mining, hydroelectricity, you name it. A valid government objective. So our, our rights are subject to so many things. And you can see, you know how genocide has created all of these hurdles for us to try to survive? Well, now our First Nation laws have to survive all of these hurdles. But even, even these First Nation laws that do become federal laws, that doesn't oust federal or provincial jurisdiction. Now you're firmly cemented in federal jurisdiction, no different than in the Indian Act. So there are First Nations who have passed child welfare laws as bylaws in the Indian Act. Those are federal laws. And they're under federal jurisdiction. So how is this markedly different? We don't know because we even don't know how the courts will interpret that. The federal national <coughs> standards contained in this act apply whether you pass your own First Nation laws or not. So when we're talking about First Nation laws, it's only if and only after we decide what's best for you and then you can do some native stuff around the edges. So if you want to add some language and culture, all of the stuff they don't consider important. All of the stuff that is incredibly important to us. They can say, no, that doesn't meet with our national standards. So now, here's some things I just want you to consider before I end. Um, we all know that there's an urgent crisis in child welfare. So our emergency issue right before us today is how do we make sure that today, more babies aren't taken out of the hospitals and that we're bringing our kids home. And thank goodness we have a First Nation Family Advocate Office helping us navigate that really immense system. C92 has so many legal unknowns that lawyers and judges aren't even sure how it's going to unfold. There is a high potential for both legal disputes and challenges, and I will be shocked if there isn't a province in this country that doesn't challenge it on a constitutional basis. That doesn't mean that I think they could or should win. But the provinces have a death grip on our kids and things, what they consider to be their money and their jurisdiction. And most of them probably won't relinquish that freely. The initial responses from the provinces aren't positive, and I'm just going to use Manitoba as an example. Literally, just last week, the province of Manitoba is, oh, we don't know anything about this legislation, we're in the dark, and it doesn't help us, and we already have our system in place. It doesn't bode well for potential agreements going forward. And the lack of funding in child welfare continues. So that hasn't been addressed, and the word from the federal government is, at least what they're telling the First Nations I work with, is we've already spent the money for this year and next year. There is no extra money allocated. How on earth can you build infrastructure and hire people and train people and address the crisis if there's no funding? It's forcing us to rely on the status quo and then making it look like that was our choice. And this legislation sets it up very clearly. And the provinces still have considerable control. Although this legislation is sold to us like, no, you're going to get to oust provincial legislation? No, you don't. It's concurrent. Provincial laws and legislation is going to continue alongside federal laws. The only issue is going to be what happens when there's a conflict. In theory, the federal laws, i.e. First Nation laws, are supposed to be trumping that. But we don't know that because Bester's yes. yes. child yes. can be uh, Trump all of it. And then federal control over all the laws and regulations. So going forward, I know it's complex and it's different in every issue. Like there's some area in Maritimes uh, I was talking to a lady this morning. Um, like in PEI, there isn't a single native child in care. That's just, oh my gosh, that warms my heart. But we know that's not the case in most places in this country. So we have to think very carefully about Protecting our sovereignty and jurisdiction over things as critical to our families and well-being as children. That the best interest of the child cannot be taken in isolation from their families, their communities, their nations, and defined as if they're somehow a separate being that can, that can just be happy in a completely different context. 
that's part of the problem with, with the provincial interpretation of best interest of the child. We have urgent harm reduction to do, making sure no more kids go into care, but also prevention to do. And, and somehow we have to navigate ongoing genocide all at the same time, which means challenging the whole system and the money that's behind it and who makes the money behind it. And then there's really important questions that we haven't talked about yet. Who's liable for all of this? Once C92 comes into effect, who's liable? Because I guarantee you they'll all fight for jurisdiction, but they'll all deny liability. And if you look at all of the other federal legislation passed by conservative and liberal governments at the national level, there's a concurrent theme. It's the transfer of responsibility and liability to First Nations without the corresponding funding and governing powers. And what about insurability? Some of the issues that insurance lawyers have raised with me is, Pam, it is incredibly difficult to get insurance for agencies, especially around group homes and things like that. Now imagine new entities are created or hybrid entities are completely different ones. Who's going to be insuring them? Who's paying for that insurance? Who's responsible? What's the liability maxim maximums? And then, when does this all come into force? I mean, honest to goodness, who at Justice Canada thought that 12 midnight on New Year's Eve, party night central, was the best time to have C92 come into effect? Think of all of the emergency applications that will be done in court on a regular year on New Year's Eve because of parents that are missing or parents that have addictions or any number of issues. And now we're going to go say, oh, by the way, as of a minute ago, this whole new legislation applies with no education, no legal practices, no policies. Oh my goodness. And again, who, who's the most at risk for this? Social workers will be going, well, I don't, I don't really know. Who do I call? Who's the jurisdiction one here? How's it going to be interpreted? And then, of course, who has even communicated with tribal police, municipal, federal, provincial police officers? Are the RCMP pretty sure about when they can go in and get a kid and when they can't? I'm pretty sure not. So my respectful advice is, and, and this kind of ends up my presentation because I'm eight seconds over two, um, don't rush to follow the path that Canada has laid out before you. Never in the history of contact has the path that's been laid out before us ever been in our best interests. That's the path of genocide. So we should always take it with a great deal of skepticism and mistrust. And that's rightful. That's not pessimistic. That's not chip on shoulder. That's called being prudent. That's called due diligence. Never follow the path. Take the time we need to make strategic decisions. You know how they're always trying to rush us to make settlements? One of the biggest things we've had on our time is we can just outlast this Prime Minister and this one and this Minister of Indian Affairs. I mean, how many Minister of Indian Affairs have we gone through just in our lifetimes? Time doesn't work for them, but it certainly works for us. And our people need time to talk about these things. Do you want to legislate First Nation foster care all right now, all of it? Do you want to do it a staged approach? Do you want to do it inside C92, outside C92? It takes time to think about that, and it's okay to take time. We're dealing with genocide. Genocide requires strategic, thoughtful, responsible approaches. Because every time we follow that path laid out by Canada, boy, we get into bigger and bigger and bigger engage with your citizens early and often and ongoing about the laws, the values. Maybe some of your citizens don't want to talk laws, but they want to say, well, what are our core values? What does child welfare mean to us? Enough food to eat, a warm house to live in, love, going to school. It's going to be different in each First Nation. Take the time to do what the values are, because it's the values that determine what the laws are, not vice versa. Sometimes we try to focus on the laws without forgetting what the values are. And consider a staged approach. You don't have to trigger that notice right away and say, oh, in 12 months now our laws are going to be in effect. What if we did some tester laws? What if we tested some of these laws in court? What if we tested to see if we're going to get funding for these? What if the kind of laws we passed said, according to our Methuselah creation law, 
the federal government is liable to fund all First Nation kids in care on this basis. That anything goes wrong, the federal government is liable. The, the provincial government is liable. We can pass laws like that. We don't have to do the laws they tell us. And then see, how does that pan out? How does that get supported? Why would we give them the gift of all of our laws first and let them annihilate it in one round? When we can just do testers. And it's up to us. As sovereigns, it's up to you. Do you want the whole basket now? Do you want to do it in a staged approach? Do you not want to do it at all? Because as sovereigns, we get to choose. And there's no blame in those who want to do it all right now and those who just feel like we need to focus on harm reduction. I just need to focus on keeping these kids in care until we're okay. And then we'll focus on governance. We don't have to do a one-size-fits-all approach. We're okay. And we will be okay. And we'll continue to be okay. And guess who's going to win at the end of the day? We are. Because there's one thing that our kids have heard loud and clear for the last decade is we hear you, we see you, and we are bringing you home. And we will make sure that happens.